and uh, may not come out all right, but I, I know it's, uh, it's in the ballpark. I may not use the right words or the best words to express it, but I do know that the spirit of those words are for someone. And if nobody here can use those words, I myself certainly can use them. I want to talk today on the subject, be encouraged. Be encouraged. And it may go a little bit different than you think. But uh, I want us to uh, petition the Lord in prayer that he will guide us as we explore his word. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, once again, we come as a lump of clay. We come empty. We come without uh, recommendation. There's nothing that I can recommend uh, this word to you. You are recommended, re recommending it to us. And so, Lord, we pray that our minds will be clear to understand uh, this word. We pray for the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. Forgive us for where we have fallen short. And uh, give us the strength to carry out your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew, the 8th chapter. Matthew, chapter 8. If you found the verse, uh, chapter one, uh, chapter eight, verse one, uh, say amen. In fact, let's go to ch uh, chapter eight, verse 14. And the Bible reads, and when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever and he touched her hand and the fever left her and she arose and ministered unto them and when even was come they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils and he cast out the spirits with his word and he healed all their sick that it might be fulfilled that which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying he himself took our infirmities and bare our sickness well. and then there's a change up until now, there's joy in Zion. There's a great atmosphere of encouragement. Heaven seems to have come down to earth. The sick are healed. People are getting better. Devils are leaving the church. And the people are excited, looking forward to happy days but then the Bible goes on to say in verse 18 now when Jesus saw the great multitudes about him he gave commandment to depart unto the other side and a certain scribe came to him and said unto him master I will follow thee wherever thou goest. Well, who wouldn't after watching Jesus do all those miracles? Well, I'd become a disciple in a minute. I wouldn't even have to be a Christian to follow Jesus if I saw all of that. He says, I will follow you wherever you go. And verse 20 says, Jesus looked at him and and gave him a message and says, the foxes have holes 
and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And then another disciple said unto him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. It, it just seems so kind of out of place that Jesus would respond when it seems this way, when it seems that heaven was coming down to the earth. Could it be that Jesus is trying to tell the church something? He's trying to tell us what it means to really follow Christ. Amen. Multitudes have received blessings, the blessings of health, blessings of peace of mind. But Jesus wanted to prepare them for what is coming. He had to let them know that being Jesus or our perception of Jesus is not a cosmic Santa Claus. Well, he had to let them know that he was not promising his disciples plenty days of ease and satisfaction. He was not promising the church that if you put a seed in a particular ministry, or you put your money over here, that you're going to get a blessing somewhere else. Well. He was saying to the church that was coming, it's not about naming it and claiming it. In fact, Jesus was not promising each and every one of us worldly wealth or influence, or status, or power, not even political power. Well, he said, don't expect special treatment just because you're a follower of me. Amen. Don't expect to get the highest seats. Don't expect to make the most money uh, because foxes have holes and birds have nests. But the Son of Man don't even have a place to lay his head. And as I thought about this, I, I thought to myself, you know, sometimes we can be disillusioned about what it means to be a Christian. He says, don't think that you can have divided interests in the house of God. Don't think you can be half the world and half Christ. Or love your family a little bit and love Christ a little bit. No, Jesus says, there shall be no divided loyalties. I must come first. So let the dead bury their dead. The ties of spiritual kinship are run deeper than those of even familiar relationships. Blood ties are secondary to spiritual ties. So let the dead bury their dead, and the foxes have holes, and the birds have nests. Jesus is trying to correct our misunderstanding about what it means to be a follower of Christ. And I had to grapple with that for the last two weeks, because I was wrestling with God. I was angry at God. Why have I had a setback? I'm trying to serve you. I'm trying to follow you. And yet it seems that I'm being reverted back to where I was five years ago, wheelchair and cane and, and, and everything is hurting, headache all of the time, and yet I've got to preach. I don't feel like preaching. Well. I don't feel good, Lord. Could you not have kept the enemy back? Could you have not prevented these things? Jesus says the foxes have holes and the birds have nests, but don't expect that you're going to be pat on the back. So, what is it that Christ is telling his disciples just before he gets on that boat? Because now he's moving from the multitude to the boat, right? And I don't have time to even deal with the boat, so we'll deal with the boat next week. But he says something on the boat. He says something when he called the sea. He said, why are you so fearful, O ye of little faith? But he's got something to teach us, brothers and sisters. We are disciples, and sometimes he puts us in the boat, knowing what the boat is headed for, knowing what's about to happen inside of the boat, knowing that the boat is about to sink, or it seems that way. So he's trying to tell us, And the message is this, brothers and sisters. It takes courage 
to be a Christian. What did I say? It takes courage to be a Christian. Just in case you have a misunderstanding about what it means to be a Christian. Just in case you watch the, the uh, televangelists on television and they fly planes and, and maybe if I'm faithful and, and I give this and I give that and I, maybe I'll be blessed in that way. Just in case you think that living a Christian life is gonna be a rose garden. Well. There will be disappointments. There will be setbacks. You will get sick. No matter what you do. Amen. And if you live long, long enough, you will die. Amen. So don't be disillusioned. Because if everything went well for you, there would not have been a need or requirement for the Christian to possess courage. A Christian, brothers and sisters, is a champion. Champions are people that people admire. They stand out from the crowd. Why? Because they possess courage. That uh, 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 track runner who is about to faint, but he or she keeps going and wins the prize in spite of the way they feel. Amen. It takes courage to be a Christian. And if it is essential that a soldier manifest courage. Can you imagine a soldier going into a, a battlefield and not having courage? Can you imagine that? Well, He'd be, I'm not going, I'm not going to, the, to that line. I'm not going there. If it's required that a soldier have courage, how much more Courage is needed for those who are in the army of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, we need courage today. And Jesus said it over and over and over. Be of good courage. Be of good cheer. Take heart. Be of good courage. He would not have said it if it were not necessary. He would not have said it if there were not forces that are calculated to rob you of courage. Amen. So courage is needed because, because he's already foreseen that you're going to need courage in order to live this world. So he says, be of good courage. Turn with me to John chapter 16. He says it over and over. John 16, 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. Well, that's one thing he's promising, peace. You may not get a Rolls Royce, but you will have peace. And there are a whole lot of people with Rolls Royces, and they don't have peace. He said, I have spoken these things that in me you might have peace in the world. Ye shall have what? Tribulation, trouble. You will have it. You, you are not exempt. You are not so special that God is exempting tribulations from your life. In fact, you're so special that he's allowing it to come to you. Because he knows a tribulation will do you good. Amen. And so he says, in the world you will have tribulations, but be of good courage. Amen. Why? Because I, he says, have overcome the world. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is our champion. Amen. He is the, he is exhibit A of what courage looks like. Now, just for a working definition, Let's try to define courage. Courage is that quality of mind or spirit that enables a person to face difficulty, danger, or pain without fear. A 
is it quality of mind or spirit that enables a person to face difficulty, danger, and even pain without anxiety, without fear. That's courage. And when you see it, you know it. Courage is not necessarily the absence of fear, but it is the capacity to act in spite of fear. You know, a dog ran up on me once, big dog, and he was ho ho hollering and growling, and, and I turned around, and my heart was just beating like that. I was scared to death, but I didn't, I didn't run from the dog, right? I don't, I don't know what that was, but I, would, I, I think if Jesus would have been standing in front of that dog who was charging him, he would not have any fear. He wouldn't, his heart rate wouldn't have increased. He would have just said, peace, be still. And the dog would just turn around. Amen. Aren't you glad that someone like that is looking after you? And so do you understand why he says, have no fear? because I'm with you. Fear thou not, I am thy God. Be not dismayed. I will instruct you. I will teach you in the way you should go. So be encouraged, he says. But courage is that quality of mind where we can act in spite of fear or consequences. And most people are fearful because of consequences. Now, we, we, we understand that uh, among young people, there is a fear of being different from everybody else. But I'm here to tell you, that is alive and well, even among adults. We don't like to be singular. We don't like to be pointed out. And to be faithful to God, even when we are in the minority, requires courage. And Jesus says, be of good courage. You need courage because there are thousands of ways Satan can discourage you. That, that's why people are, are so, even in the church, are so up and down. Because we don't know how to ride the waves. You know, we get turned upside down when this happened or this didn't go our way. We, we, we just throw a fit. And, and what is needed is courage. And we e we're easily, too easily discouraged. And the devil has more than a thousand ways to discourage us. We need to be encouraged this morning. Some have been laid off from their jobs and they face an uncertain future. Well... They've just gone, you've just gone through a divorce, you face an uncertain future. You've just been diagnosed with some incurable disease and you face an uncertain future. You don't know what's ahead of you. Well. And you're experiencing the trial of your faith trying to raise children that have, that, that have seemingly gone crazy. But brothers and sisters, the greatest need in the church today is those who will exhibit courage and confess Christ in word and in deed on all occasions. You know, sometimes you can act and it looks like courage, but it's really not. I, I remember when I was, uh, I had just left Oakwood College. I had just become a Christian six months prior. 
uh, and I think I was home on leave. And I walked into the garage one day and I saw my brother sitting there and he had a wound on his face. And I said, what happened? He says, I had, I had been away from the hood for about two years, right? So I'm, I don't know what's going on. He says, well, those brothers around the corner, this is in South Central LA, they took my check, well. right? I'm a Christian, so I know how to handle this situation. I said, well, let's go, let's go around there. So I said, and he said, oh, I don't want to go around there. I said, no, let's, let's go around there. So we, we walk up on the house, up the stairs, knock on the door, and before I left Brother Mitchell, I took a hatchet and just put it in my back pocket. I'm a, I'm a Christian now, right? That's what I'm saying. Not everything, not every action can be coined as courage. So I, I got this big hatchet in the back, you know, I, and I don't know, I'm, I'm not, I'm just acting. I'm not even thinking, right? I, I didn't even pray. But I'm going to take care of business because this is, you know, as a Christian, you know what's right and what's wrong. This is wrong. And so we're going to deal with this. So I say to the brother, you, are you the brother that took my brother's check? You know, we like to have that right. Oh, no, I'm not the brother. I, you know, I, said, no, no. I said, is he? He said, yeah, he's one. I said, my, my brother don't lie, you know. So a scuffle ensues. Uh, thank God I didn't use the hammer, but, but I used my something. And the result was I had a swollen eye. The other person had a swollen lip. And he still don't have his money. <laughs> right? And, um, and I'm out here on the front lawn fighting. I'm a Christian, you know, and I'm fighting. Now, uh, there have probably, if I had prayed about that, it would have been a better way to take care of that. Yeah. Right? And it's just the grace of God that the hatchet wasn't used. It's just the grace of God. But I can't say one thing. No one ever tried to take his check again. I mean, there's one benefit came out of it. But I'd rather him get the money back. You know what I'm saying? But brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to say is some things pass for courage, and they're not necessarily courage. It's craziness. And sometimes we act crazy in the church and we think it's courage, but it's just crazy. You see, courage is to believe the Bible and live by it, in spite of the way you feel. Courage means to forgive that brother and sister in spite of the way you feel. Courage says that I'm not going to avenge myself because my only concern now is to is to glorify God that's why I live I do not live to avenge myself I live to glorify him and if I can change the heart of my enemy by loving him or her to death then God will be glorified Amen. that takes courage Amen. that's what courage looks like Courage is David going up before Eli uh, uh, um, Goliath. You know, he's not thinking, he's not just defending himself. He said, you have defied the armies of the living God. Now that's a fight God can fight. <laughs> you defy God in his sanctuary. That, that, that's worth fighting. But you notice he's, he's not angry. He he's just uses the simple means He's not trying to uh, claim credit for knocking this big giant down. He fights the giant in a way that only God would allow him to survive that, that attack. So God is looking for us to not only believe the Bible, but live by it. We need to be able to express and follow our convictions 
even if we are in the minority. That takes courage. A lot of folk will be a Christian when everybody else is being a Christian. But when it's just you all by yourself, I, I remember there was a business meeting. Nobody had no business voting on what they voted. I was just an a, a intern. I'm just watching and observing. I didn't even have a vote. And the entire church, a large church, everybody stood for this, this to vote, to have this activity, which really wasn't a, a spiritual activity, would not have brought God glory or anything. But you had the big people, the people with money were for it. Well, so the people that want to be in favor with the people with money will support the vote. But brothers and sisters, why it is that Christians require courage? Because it's not always what everybody does is in harmony with God. And so all in favor, please stand. The whole church stands. All right, now sit down. All not in favor stand. Now, who wants to stand <laughs> all by themselves? Little sister Tyler, and I'll say her name as long as I live. She just took her bony self and stood up and said, I will not support this. And it turned out that that old sister was right because the whole program was a flop. Lost money. It was some big, 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 big function to, to glorify some, some actor or something like that. It had nothing to do with God. Well. And brothers and sisters, we need that kind of faith. We need that kind of courage. And that's what God wants. You see, Satan is not afraid of education. He's not afraid of money. He's not afraid of riches. He's not afraid of status or position. But when a humble soul moves forward in faith, claiming the promises of God, the devil, Peter says, trembles. It's not often we see courage, but when you see it, you know it. Now, I may be wrong, and I don't usually bring political uh, stuff in, 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 in sermons and all of that. I'm, you know, that's, that's not really what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about principles. But sometimes you see things, and you say, aha, that, that may be it. Uh, the Democratic debate was taking place uh, on last week. Well. You had the frontliners there, the big wigs, well. you know. And uh, there was one lower tier candidate that nobody knows, has no, from Hawaii, and I'm, like I said, I live in Hawaii five years, person with military background, and had the opportunity to say something that no one else said and it, perhaps because they were afraid because this was a high power person and this person just brought out some hypocrisies straight right out there without fear without flinching without considering the consequences of our actions because those kind of consequences will put you out of uh Harmony with the powers, the corporate interests of America and all of that. Guaranteed to sink you. But when you stand for principle, you're not worried about the consequences. You're not worried about what men can give you. Right? So I don't know. That, it looked like courage to me. To anybody to, to say something, but you've got everything to lose, and you say it anyway? That's a champion. Because the majority of folk won't say anything because of what they stand to lose. And Jesus says to be a Christian, you gotta be willing to lose everything in order to stand for the right. You see, our biggest fear, brothers and sisters, I know and if anyone says that you don't have fears, you're a lie. Everybody in here is afraid of something. I've, I've seen bold, big men were afraid of 
little f flies and stuff, you know? Black cats. <gasps> you know, I don't want to walk past a black, black cat. I say, aren't you a, a, a soldier? <laughs> Everybody is afraid of something. But this is where we all can fall short. When we think we're going to wait till everybody else gets on board and then we'll say something. We're not talking about acting crazy. We're talking about saying something based on principle, not based on your advantage or disadvantage for saying it. Jesus wants us to live for him. So our biggest fear is not wild lions on the outside or being eaten by wild lions. Our biggest fear is what's on the inside that would keep us out of the kingdom of God. And so brothers and sisters, we have need for courage. We have a need for courage. And this is taken from last day events. Page 180, paragraph four. When the religion of Christ is most held in contempt. You believe in marriage between a man and a woman? Prepare to be under contempt. If you believe that, right? Do you believe in marriage between a man and a woman? Or are you flexible? You can have it, uh, you know, a man and a man sometimes. Well, if, 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 it's my, if it's my cousin, you know? Well, or if it's, if it's the person that that's, I stand to benefit from. Well, you know? Some people make statements and they apologize later. Well, well how do you change? If you say it and you believe it, that should settle it. Listen to this. When the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, we haven't seen anything yet. When his claims or when his law is most despised, then should our zeal be warmest? and our courage the firmest. In other words, when the heat turns up, that's when we gotta show more courage. We need to show courage and firmness and to be the most unflinching, to stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us, to fight the battles of the Lord. When champions are few, this will be our test. Are you a champion this morning? Yes. 